All right, Ben. Hi. We're back. <laughs> Today, our topic of discussion is the observer pattern, and we'll explain why you need it and how to make it better. And then uh, Jared's going to get really nerdy on you and talk about some stuff. It's the fun stuff. It's the deep fun stuff. stuff. The stuff that he likes to see in a video. That's true. Um, so I figured since this is one of the classical patterns that are um, described here in this book that we told you about, I would read you, we'll, we'll start out with, this is like reading from scripture here. <laughs> Design patterns, chapter, does it have chapters? I need to give you a pulpit. Page 293, Observer. So the observer, it says here, defines a one-to-many dependency between objects so that when one object changes state, all its dependents are notified and updated automatically. That there is important. Then if you read a little further down, um, a common side effect of partitioning a system into a collection of cooperating classes is the need to maintain consistency between related objects. This is the important part. You don't want to achieve consistency by making the classes tightly coupled because that reduces their reusability. So let's start with an example. Let's draw this abstractly. Yeah, I'm going to erase this. And let's, uh, the, the classic example of this is a user interface. That's the example that I used down there. Um, so typically, in your user interface, you have like buttons, OK, and maybe an input something here in a title, whatever going on. Yeah. So you can think of each of these objects in here as its own distinct object. So there's a button, an input. There's a, two buttons, an input, and a title bar. And a title. So here's a collection of objects. And then over here, this is kind of abstract, but here's, I'm going to call it the controller. The controller is in charge of managing everything that goes on in here. Um, the first time you write an interface like this, you might be tempted to make the link between your controller and your buttons tightly coupled. And that's a bad idea. An example of tightly coupling those things would be um, in your code for your button here. Let's draw down here the code. For the button, we say uh, on click controller dot say hi. <laughs> okay, so this is the code for the button. Now the problem here is that now this button knows that the controller has a method called say hi. So now we're stuck. Now, we can only ever use this dialog box with a controller that has a say hi method on it. Um, you might want to reuse this pretty generic looking dialog box. You might want to reuse this on some other controller that does a different job. And by tightly coupling those, you can't do that. So Also, it can only do whatever it's, it's... So if you wanted to do more things here, You'd have to remember everything you want to do. Let's say that, that the controller wanted to do three or four things, different yeah. different things on that okay. Then that, that button would have to know about everything so that it wanted to do. Say hi, save something. Yeah. Um, eat. I don't know. <laughs> what does the controller do in its spare time? So this is called, this is tightly bound because the controller has to know everything about the dialog box and the dialog box has to know everything about the controller. This is bad. We need to decouple these things. So what we do is we make the dialog box totally ignorant that the controller even exists. So we can erase the controller, and you click OK, and the dialog box ought to be able to run whatever code it runs happily. Right, even the button should be able to be, uh, you know, the button itself is, a, is an object, right? Yeah, the button, the, when you click the button, something happens. Whatever that does, I mean, the button should be in charge of 
um, turning dark when you press the mouse down, or maybe there's a hover thing. Yeah. It's in charge of that. But in terms of what happens outside this dialog box, the button should have no clue. So down here on the button handler, maybe delineate this a little more, um, we need to remove any references to the controller. Okay. Well, that felt good. Ah, now it's clean and free. So how the controller over here, I'll, I'll put our controller back, it still needs to know about things that happen over here, right? How do we do that? We employ the observer pattern. Hmm. So now the on-click event, when you, where, when you click this, on-click says, um, what should we say? We'll say fire. Yeah. Fire event. Okay. And that's all it does. So whenever you click the button, it says, okay. 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 So how does the controller know about... How does it subscribe, so to it, speak? It needs to capture this event, right? So this event goes out, and the controller... It's okay for the controller to know about the dialog box. So the controller goes to the dialog box and say, it subscribes. It says, hey, I want to know about your events. And it usually does that by handing in a callback of some sort. Right. It says, here, dialog box, when an event happens, do this. So... Um, I'll borrow Jared here for a second. What am I going to do? Jared's the dialog box. I'm okay. the controller. Okay. Jared, whenever Blake says your name, do this. And that's instructions to, like, yell or something. Okay. Jared. Yell! Oh! <laughs> oh, good. Word. So, uh, <laughs> hey, you yelled, and I caught that, and I every time you yell, I'm going to do something. Jared. Right inside of yeah. Yeah. yeah! Okay, so we got... <laughs> you're a very good... Uh, uh, event emitter. <laughs> yes. And now when you're done, you take that back. Yeah, I have to, I'll take now, that now back. Now yell again. Jared. Isn't that awesome? I didn't yell. So and it, anyways, and I never found out. So it's like a contract between between the button and the controller. But it's loosely it's loosely coupled because the the button just says, here, this is how you subscribe to me, and I'll notify you. Mm-hmm. So, uh... Let's do. Let's get a little more concrete here. We'll give you an example of how this works on the DOM. Everything. Let's do it the standard, the standard way, not i8 or i9. <laughs> I yeah. think i9 might be okay, but um, let's have a button. So pretend that we've selected this button using jQuery or Query Selector or something yeah. out of out of a DOM tree. So, I have a button. So this is your controller script. This is in JavaScript, yeah. Um, and HTML and JavaScript have solved half of this problem for you. All of the elements that go on a page do uh, the event emitting half already. You click on something and it emits a click event. But I want to know about this, so I'm going to say button um, and Add event listener. 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 Lis whatever. <laughs> Sorry. Someone's going to say something about listener. that one. Listener. We'll put it in the comments. ER. There you go. Listener. Okay. And then I think the first parameter is the event. Yep. Click. And. Normally false. Oh, uh, I guess there is a third parameter There's here. A third that, parameter, yeah. um, what is it? Use capture. It captured bubbling. It's used for the bubbling up. Yeah. Um, check MDN on that one. Wait. It, it's good to know. I'm gonna leave it out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Buddy. Thank you. Buddy. No, no need for notes on that one. <laughs> good job. Yeah. <laughs> Nine times out of ten, you can get out, get away without using the third argument. Um, but you should know about it. Yeah. Don't read about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now, anytime this button gets clicked, the browser is going to do this. So you're, you're saying that it reruns that function every time there's a click. It's yeah. not just called once. Yeah. If it, every time this click happens, that function gets called. That's awesome. And so I'll do something interesting in here. Hi. 
So, so could you do something like this? Let's say you had a variable. This is where it gets kind of neat. You could say var um, x is equal to zero, and could you could do this, couldn't you? Yeah. And then console log it out. Although I thought we decided not to use the double. I know. I, I just did that just for you. <laughs> no, we would not do that. Uh, I, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. I won that battle. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> X plus one. There we go. Yeah, that was that was a bad example, but <laughs> <laughs> no, you did good, but mine would have been fouled up on that. Oh yeah, semicolons, Jerry. Come oh, <laughs> sorry, Douglas. Uh, <laughs> so anytime this button gets clicked, then this happens, and this is great. This is the only that I know. This is the only sane way to do user interfaces because there's so many things going on that if you were to try and tightly bind all of your interface elements to the things in the controllers, you'd lose your mind and you'd take up basket weaving or something. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with basket weaving. <laughs> um, so this is great, and, and we, we've written the web this way for a long time. This is called um, just event observing. Yeah, it's an observer pattern. They actually, I think it was so well known and so well respected by the time they made the DOM that they just made a part of it. Yeah, it's but, built right in. What's awesome is in JavaScript we have these these awesome things called functions that allow us to do it a lot easier. If you look at the book and it gives Java examples, it's horrendous because you actually have to send it an object in that gets executed because yeah. they don't have the cool functions you have as to, objects. You have to pass in a runnable one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it gets a little hairier, but the principle's the same. The principle's the same. Yeah. Just in JavaScript, we're really lucky that functions are first-class objects, and uh, we can just pass them around like that. You you can and will a lot define this function elsewhere, give it a name, and just add it right back. Okay, now there will come a time where you want to stop caring about what that button does, and uh, for the sake of memory management, this is something you should get in the habit of, is when you're done removing this event listener. Yes. Which, in this case, the way I've written it here, we can't do because we used an inline function here, a function literal, <laughs> and in yeah. order to remove the event listener, you have to give in the function that you use to register the listener. So, so that anonymous function you couldn't get back to. You yeah, I, I, I can't get it back. So, um, Are you going to show them the tricky way? So what you okay. do is say var foo equals a function that does something great and then you add the event listener and when you're done sometime later it remove event <laughs> listener oh good job Ben you got that in there click they're already asleep now foo <laughs> all right now there you go We've removed the event listener, <laughs> and now it's not going to happen anymore. This is kind of nice, but it's kind of, kind of annoying all at the same time. Um, so, I'm going to bring Jared back. Oh man, I didn't know that we were having these. What are we doing now? It's time for an object lesson. And I don't have a clue what's going on. So, Jared, you are going to be the event emitter. Okay. And under the first scenario, I would say, Jared, whenever something's quick, do that. Okay. So whatever Blake says your name, uh, jump or something. Jared. Jared. Okay, now I want Jared to stop jumping. You can say his name as much as you want. Jared. But uh, you didn't take this back. Jared, I stop jumping. Jared, stop jumping. Jared. No, I stop Jared. jumping. Take the contract. Uh, shoot, <laughs> I forgot to do something. All right, stop. In order for this to work, I have to keep a hold of this thing. All oh, right, oh, there Jared. Thank you. Whenever he says your name, jump. Jared. Oh, there we go. Jared. Yeah, this I'm, is great. I Jared, want Jared, Jared to stop jumping. And I've kept a reference to that thing now. Jared. So I'm gonna say, Jared, stop jumping. <laughs> Jared. And now he's done. So that's what we've done here. So just like that, that we gave uh, reference in those, those like, the tags. tags. This is exactly what strings. that is. So you, you had you had reference to that, and you could yank it away from me, basically. Now it's annoying for me to have to keep hold 
of this string while you're jumping away. And, it's, <laughs> so. and, and to define, to have to pull out your function definitions out here to set an event listener, I also find to be annoying. I agree with that. So um, Jared here, with the help of some brilliant people on the interwebs, um, <laughs> solved this problem for us. And it is called the observer. Yes. This is not implemented in your browser by default. Um, there is an implementation in this mystical base library we keep talking about, which we will have documentation for someday. Um, so let's talk about that real quick. In abstract, do you have your phone on you? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to say, Jared, whenever Blake says your name, do this. Okay. And now, Jared's going to give me his phone. Oh, well, wait a second here. <laughs> So go ahead. Jared. Oh, now, because Jared has Jared. given me something, I can call it. Jared. Well, I guess I've got his phone. But I can say, hey, Jared, stop jumping. Jared. Too bad, Blake. Jared, uh, Jared, start jumping again. Jared. Jared. Now stop. Jared. Now never jump again. Jared. See, isn't that cool? By giving me the, the reference to that thing, then I have hold on that. That thing is the observer. I'm going to hand it to Jerry now. Well, what we've noticed is when we had the we implemented this observer pattern, we were dealing with entities. What I mean by entities is just a plain old object. And so we wanted for a good example is like person, and we wanted to know when the person's first name changed. And if if we did it the old way, right, the old style, you pass in the function, you had to keep you had to keep hold of that function. Well, we found reasons. At times, we wanted to unsubscribe while we did some changes and then resubscribe. So we had to hold that function and put it on, then take it off, and put it on, and take it off. And, and, and with this med method, you can't do it. You can add the listener, and you can take it, away. it away. And that's it. But I can't turn it back on again. So what, what Ben's describing here is an interface. So what happens is, what we decided to do, we have to, well, let's just do this. So we'll call it a person, since we described a person, right? And we'll, we'll subscribe or observe to that person. So we'd say a person dot observe, and we'll we'll get it into observe in a minute. But for now, it's called observe type. Oh, observe property. Sorry, observe property. We pass in the type. So let's say we wanted to listen for a first name to change. Then we pass it the function. Right. This looks the same, doesn't it, Ben? Yeah, that looks really similar. In fact, it looks exactly the same. But there's one key difference. Is it sends us back something that we can save. And that's called the observer. So this person is observable. Uh -huh. And what it returns after you observe to something, to a property, is called an observer. Now the observer, so let's just put this here. Observer. Can you see that? I'm not sure if you can. But... With, with this, you get some cool functionality. So let's go through that functionality. The first thing that you can do, let's raise this up a little bit, because we, we did something fancy in here. We're just not going to talk about it. You can say, okay, observer, like Ben just said, he had the phone in his mouth, and he said, hey, stop. All right, later he said, observer, start. And then maybe stop again. I can turn it off and on as much as I want. As long as he has reference to this observer, he can do, and he doesn't have to even have reference to his function. The anonymous function can still go in. And the coolest thing is when you're done and you know you're done, you just simply say, dispose. So we found this really useful, the start-stop behavior, really useful in state machines. Oh, yeah. Where the object, when it's in one state, can receive actions, and when it's in another state, it can't. A good example is animations. Yeah. Animations are this ugly land where there's like a state between two states. Like the movie? Like try, like animating yeah, two? Yeah, so it takes a half a second or however long for this thing to get up there. And while that happens, um, you can't do anything. In limbo land. So you put it into an inactive state. And when that happens, you just turn off the observers. It, it, it's a beautiful concept because what he's describing is if this needs to go over there, right? We know of three states, right? So this is one, this is two, this is three. Mm-hmm. And you always have to account for this, but with this, once it starts, you're just like, okay, stop listening, and it's moving, it's done, start listening, and you're done. Yeah, this is, this is super helpful. 
So the other thing is, where did this come from? Where did this principle of observer come from? Well, it wasn't my idea, uh, of course. None of these good ideas are ever my idea. Um, but, I, but I like to write them to understand them. And what I came across is a, um, a video by Eric Myers on Channel 9. Um, Channel 9 is, I think, is it MSDN? Channel9.msdn.com. Yeah. I can't even remember. I just type in Channel 9 and click. But anyways, Eric Myers is a genius, and he realized something in the, I think, around 2008. I could have even been earlier. He was put at task to um, create a, a, an observing system. But what he did is he realized something. He said, what's the difference between this, this is an array, right? Mm -hmm. So we declare this as an array, or data streaming in? Like from a disk or from the network. Right, so let's just, let's, let's just do dot, dot, dot to represent that it's constant. There's infinite, infinite this way, right? And then one, two, three, four, and then infinite this way too. So he, he realized something, that there's a similarity between arrays and streaming data. And I think that this realization was awesome. And he began to think, why is it that we have to iterate through a finite set, so if you notice that this is called a finite set, we know the beginning, we know the length, right? You can go array.length. With this, this, you don't, there is no length. You don't know when the mouse is going to die. You don't know when it started. But yeah. you do know when you started listening. Every array has a length. Even in JavaScript, where you're able to dynamically grow and maybe shrink yeah, the shrink. array, uh -huh. uh, the array always has a fixed length. So this is finite, and this is infinite. So what he discovered is like, with him and his math degree, I guess, because he's a math guru, I am not, so I can't say it. He, he looked at how we iterate through fixed, finite arrays. And that's done in C Sharp in another language through what's called the I enumerable and I enumerator. The I meaning interface. Enum, yeah, interface. Enum, my heavens. There. Okay. It's not just me. <laughs> so, so what happened here is this I enumerable has something on it called. Um, so the interface to this has a get enumerator. What it returns is an I enumerator. So this function returns this. Then this has. Well, okay, let's, let's simplify it a little bit, but it has two functions. One's called um, next, and the other one's called, and it returns a bool, and the, and the other one's called um, current. current, which gives you the actual item that it's on. So you'd call next, so for example, when you first get the enumerator, you call next and get current. Yeah. But that can be represented in a simplified form. So, just real quick. Uh, these enumerators have internal pointers that say where you are. Correct. So that pointer is right there. Yeah. And when you call next, it moves the pointer to here. And you call next, and it moves it to here. If you call next and it's able to move to the next one, that's the bool. It, it yes. returns. It returns, hey, I'm done, basically. Faults can't get the next one. Yeah. Then when you call current, it just pops out a three or, or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So with this, he realized, he goes, Knowing his math degree, he says, I need to do, I need the opposite. He said, this form of, of um, getting data or accessing data is more of a push philosophy, meaning I want it now. And the other ones, let's go ahead. So you're commanding the data source. Yes, I'm commanding down at you saying, give it to me now. Okay. And it's, it's, it's not later, it's I am waiting. It's like my dad used to say, a dollar wait, not a dime. So get going. And, and... They, they go and get it, and, they, and I'm waiting until it comes back. This other method is called a pull. He realized something. You notice that those arrows are going different directions. You can't do a push to an infinite source. It just isn't possible. Because you don't have a beginning and you don't have an end. Mm -hmm. But you can do a pull to an infinite source. So, let's talk about that. So, he called this duality. And I'm probably watching every... He's probably, if he ever watches this video, he'll just cringe because I'm not going to give it justice. But if you go watch his, um, his videos, you'll understand a lot better. So with this duality, he realized all he has to do is say, okay, what's the interface for enumerators and enumerables? 
and the, the, the key one is with the enumerator and the next. But we're going to simplify it. Instead of next just returning um, a bool, let's have it return the actual item. And when it's done, maybe, uh, well, let's just simplify it for now because you can't really do null. But let's just simplify it real quick. So the interface on the enumer enumerator is I want to get next, and it returns immediately an item. So how do we flip this around? In order for this to be different, we have to, we have to give it an item and return void or undefined. So this is what he realized. He goes, so how do I do this? Well, this right here can actually be done through a callback. So that's where he realized with the observer pattern that when you give a function, the function is actually matches the signature of next. But the yang or yin or however you say that, yin yang, I don't know how you say that, but <laughs> the opposite of what the enumerator was. So that is the birth of the observer. So remember how the enumerable had the enumerator, observable has the observer. Now let's... And that observer is the phone. Yes, is the phone. Now let's let's look at this a little bit differently. Now we're in JavaScript land. Now we're not just in theory land. I'm going to represent this in a way that's really quite awesome to see. And you under you start realizing that you can do this, and it makes sense because it can look just like a finite array, but it's really infinite. So let's say we have an array. So we're over here. How far can I go over here? Well, you're, have two. you're still you're good. Right. Okay, so we'll have two things. So here's the one. So we want to have an array. Yeah, well, that, maybe we should put something in it. <laughs> and then we want to say a dot, let's do a filter, right? These are built-in functions now in ECMAScript 5, I believe. I believe. <laughs> you have to look at that. You can say filter, and you can supply some filter. And this is, represents the item. And in this item, I can say if i is equal to... If i is equal to this is a 1, let's do 1, let's return true. Okay, so anyways, this is getting boring really quick. Else return false. So that's going to filter it up for us. Now what's cool with JavaScript is we do this cool little, um, what's the word, Blake? It's chaining. Chaining, chaining. sorry. Yes. He, he's, a big, he's a big fan of chaining, and I just forget what it's called. But so we can chain, so we filter it. This returns an array at the end of this filter. So this is going to filter this array down to everything that equals one. So now we're going to have one in the array, right? Then we can say for each. And now we can write another function that we're not going to write out and do something with it, right? So this is the finite way of doing things. Finite. How, how can we do it in JavaScript with infinite? Infinite. Well, let's take a look. So we get an observer. So let's see, observers have to be supplied because we, we make them. You have something that's observable, then you say observe and you get it. So mm -hmm. we'll just say we have an observer. We understand the principle now. i got to get on this side. Sorry, Ben. Observer dot. Well, so we're down here now already. Because somewhere up here we got the observer. All right. Say observer dot filter, and what do you know? We it actually looks the same. We're gonna say it looks just like this. So remember this right here. That looks the same. And now instead of instead of saying for each, we say on each. And I have a function with the item, and we do something special with that. So if you, if you notice this, with JavaScript, dealing with an infinite set and a finite set is, this, is the same. What's even cooler about this observer, remember, we can start and stop it. This you can't. You're like trucking through it. It's a push uh, until you get done. This one, you can say, hey, this is what I want to filter. I want to do this on each. And then you can come down here somewhere and say, hey, stop for a minute. And this on each will stop getting fired for a little while. And then you'll say, okay, start back up, and now it'll start getting fired again. So, do a concrete example here. Um, and Jared's talking about infinite streams of data. Yeah. That might sound like bytes off of a hard drive or stuff coming down from the network, 
But when you think about it, user input is actually just an Same. infinite stream of data. The user is pushing input into your program, and you have to decide what to do with it. Right. So let's say this observer we did on the keyboard. So we're listening to key events. Oh, that's a good idea. The function is going to pass in a bunch of events, and then we say if e dot key code equals thirteen equals thirteen, which is return return. Um, then we're going to do this, whatever here, every time it's 13. And then that, isn't that descriptive? Because now you're saying um, it's pretty descriptive. You're actually filtering down before you get to the, the for each or on each, so, so to speak. Yeah. And there's even, you can even go more, because um, we've implemented filter, map, and on each. And so what that does is it allows you to say, you can even go down, and so what map does is basically selects something out of the array, you can just create another set of things mm -hmm. and then send it through, and that's what comes in on as the on each. Maybe we should give an example of that. Maybe not. This is kind of lengthy code. Yeah, you should look at uh, check out map on MDN. Discover map and reduce an MDN, and you're you will have a new world before you. It's pretty cool stuff. So I think I think that's pretty much covers what I. Oh, one more thing I wanted to say. So this is we we found out what finite uh, set of data and then an infinite, so it's a stream of data. Um, the other thing that I wanted to, to make mention is Ben was saying um, on the DOM, there's a, a principle that we keep saying over and over and over. So if you have a on your page just some kind of uh, document, so this is let's say this is the body tag, and inside of here is something else, and inside of here is something else, and you have controllers for the body, and a controller for this, and a controller mm -hmm. for that, you should always command down. Yes, uh, I'm going to write this down because it's really important. And, and this, is, this is what makes you loosely couple things because it's always important to know where, where the responsibility of one thing begins and the, and the other one ends. Otherwise, if there's overlap, there's confusion about who's doing what, who's doing what role, and then the programmer that comes in next really just botches it. And then they make this guy take more of the responsibility of this guy, and now there's, there's this confusion. Mm -hmm. So what we have a principle in ours is you command down, meaning the body knows about the two controllers inside of it. It can go and say, hey, do something, hey, do something, but it does not, these guys don't know about the body. And the only way they can communicate is to broadcast out and the body interested in listening. So that was exactly the, the events that we were talking about. So for example, if I click, it would event and the body, if the body really cared, it would listen to that special event. So, um, we're pretty serious when we say this, to the extent that these, uh, we've taken some of the agency, I guess, of these elements away from them. They are not able to remove themselves. And if you look at the DOM functions, there is no remove self. It's always remove child. Right. It's always append child. Everything happens here going down jQuery breaks that a little bit, and I'm not sure how to feel about that. <laughs> right. But we never allow elements to remove themselves. We have a dialog box, like a modal dialog that comes up and covers everything. Dialogs are always dismissed, right? So it makes sense for the dialog box to dismiss itself. But no. No! Because what if there's an error? And it doesn't know about what you're doing on that click. All the dialog box is say, says is, I'm clicked, or I'm done. Uh -huh. And or, it just says done. Yeah, exactly. I can say done to Jared a thousand times, and if he doesn't want me to be done, I'm not going to be done. It's like the overbearing parent or something. So what happens is, this is what's so beautiful, is you can have it say, um, for example, the, this can emit, hey, I'm done. And let's say there, this had some special, let's say you pass an entity to it. Uh -huh. And the entity had to be observed to. So maybe there was data change, and then we need to observe to it here. Mm -hmm. This may have a dispose function. It doesn't get rid of it, it just cleans house. It's just like, okay, I'll start unobserving whatever I had to do, disconnect to the database, yada, yada, yada. But the body can say, hey, when you're done, you dispose, now I'm going to remove you. So now there's no memory leak. Because the body had control. He knew when he took it out, he knew when to call the dispose, and mm -hmm. this guy doesn't know when to call the dispose. Because it's like, I, I'm, I think I'm done, but are you sure I'm done? And then he, does, he waits until the body says dispose, he then cleans house, then the body says, okay, now you're gone. Yeah, and we should touch on this too. Uh, you mentioned memory leaks. And this is probably the most common source of memory leaks in 
web front end programming. Yeah. You have an object and another object. If they're co-referenced, they uh, never get rid of each other. So this is one reason to use the observer pattern that helps because these objects are not co-referenced. They're only referenced one, one way, way, but they're still referenced. So one of the things that the observer object that we hand back gives you is this dispose function, which breaks this reference right. and frees up the uh, object for garbage collection. Exactly. So, so that's what he's talking about when he says dispose. A good example is we had this happen just today, actually. We fixed this. We had, we had something in here with the, let's just say, call it the first name. Oh, that's really small. That says first name. That says first name. And then another one that had last name. So we need to observe to when these things changed. Because they might be updated on the database and so forth. So we observed to it. I was actually, we changed it here and it was like listed behind here. So these things were observing a list that could disappear. But anyways, regardless. The fact was, is this needed to observe and we need to unbind ourselves. What was so cool is we just saved all those observers. Remember how we said observe? Mm -hmm. It gave us back an observer. We stuck those all in, a, in an array. And then on dispose, we just go observers for each, dispose, dispose, dispose. And it just disposes all of them and we're clean. No, no more listening. And you don't even have to worry about if it was listening to the first name or if it was listening to the last name. You don't have to remember even the function that was put in for those things. You just simply say, dispose. You have a bucket full of observers and you tell them all to take a hike. And, and, they, they, and they obey. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I think that, Blake, do you have any um, two cents? It was awesome. Blake's <laughs> snoring. What, how, what's the timer at? I got one more example if we have time. It's 36. That's okay. Oh, that's not bad. Okay. We talked about DOM. We talked about script observing to DOM things. Yeah. Um, I want to show you this cool thing that we did where our view, our UI was actually observing to entities. Mm -hmm. So we had this table that Jared was talking about. In this application, we have a table full of items. So here is a, there's a controller here, and then each of these is a component, and each of these components represents an entity. It's just an object, a plain old JavaScript object. So this really is just one thing, it's like one component. Yeah, this is like a person that has a first name and a last name and uh, maybe a birthday, Right. whatever. So we have a component for every entity, component right. entity, and what is really useful pattern where you want to represent a bunch of entities, you make a component, or an element, for each of these entities. Right. And what we did here was we told these components to observe to their entities. Right. So this component is listening to the first name and the last name and the birthday on this person object. Correct. So it's basically bound, right? So let's, It's bound. So let's say we have First, we'll just do fn, right, equals Jared for now, right? And, yeah. But what if someone comes in and changes that? Like now, me in the console. It doesn't matter who changes this person's name and where and how. This is always representing that. It's always current, up to it's date. It's always current. Jared. So I'm like a change. watching like a hawk. Ben. So now you don't even have to go, and Blake. So you don't even have to think. You basically, did with these observers, you simply say, hey, observe. When it changes, remember, it's kind of like on each. Mm -hmm. And when this does it, go and change the, the UI right here. So he sets it up, and he, does, he forgets about it. Remember, these are components that are reusable. They're the same component, but they're tied to different... Yeah, they're each tied to their own person. So we have... Uh, a data context and a service that runs these applications. And so I change uh, a first name and then the application saves it up to the service. As here service, we edited the name. It's like Tron when he holds that thing up. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. I haven't seen Tron yet. Sorry, that was probably really bad. Okay. People aren't going to watch her. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go watch Tron tonight. How's that sound? <laughs> I'm too busy programming. Okay. Okay, sorry. Bring in the logic pro. That's my favorite <laughs> line of the movie. Okay. Where were we? Oh, yeah. So, we've pushed this person up to the service, and the service has the authority to say, yes, you can, or no, you can't. Right. So, the service says, you can't do that. 
and the data context comes and says, oh, mm, you can't do that, and puts the name back, this changes back automatically. The user knows immediately that that was not allowed. And we had this cool little thing that Blake did that gives us little, error, it says error Y, a little message right below it. And so they know why that changed back. They try to change Blake's name to Ben, but then it comes back and says, you can't do that because you don't have permission. Mm -hmm. changes, and changes Ben back to Blake. And yeah. this thing didn't even know why, just, just was listening to this guy. And that's all we need. Brought to you by the power of the observer pattern. You cannot write complicated applications if you are mortal without the observer pattern. Yep. It's the only way to manage the complexity that I know of. And, and the more you use it, the more you realize the, 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 you, start, you start abusing it. Not abusing it, just like, well, I could use it to solve this problem. I can use it to solve this problem. And then your application gets these really complex situations going on, but it, it all manages. The, the complexity becomes something you can manage. It's, it moves the whole complexity up to a layer where you can actually think like a human being instead of having to get down and be a computer. We've always had, we all had those moments where we're so in the zone that we're like, I am the computer, and we're doing a great job, and then we come back tomorrow and don't have a clue what we were doing. One more thing, that's exactly right, is what if, what if we had something else, this is where it gets really good, and Blake was tied to here too, right? So it's connected to that. This is where it gets really, when it's in three or four oh, places on the totally page. didn't mention this benefit. Th th this is where it gets really awesome. Because you don't, you, you just don't think about it. You're just like, okay, I know I'm concerned. I'll observe, and when when I change this, watch how good this is. There you go. There he starts to go. It automatically changes the UI to bin, and everywhere it is. So now you're. So this is why it's so easy. If you know, there's some applications on the web that drive me crazy, like the percentages. Uh, there's a certain application. <laughs> there's like, just update the ding percentage. But it doesn't because it doesn't use this pattern. If they actually had an object that represented the percentage, they could observe to it, and then they could actually have it update. But they don't, and it drives me literally crazy because I know better. If there's a web app, you have to refresh the page to get a new percentage. Anyways. Come on, company, which shall not be named. It's 2014. <laughs> That's right. So this is the way to do it, and I hope that they, uh, they watch the video. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you're listening, company, the show must and, be oh, and the cause of that problem is because they're trying to command down everything, meaning they're not, they're not listening to changes on an object. They're trying to say, okay, when something changes, I have to remember everywhere that changes. So when somebody comes in and goes, oh, we want to add this new little cool functionality, and they just add it over here, well, in that main update function, doesn't know about this new thing yet. Yeah. And this new thing, if it, did, if it had the observer pattern running, it just has to have reference to that observer and it, you're done. This is the magic, we keep saying we're done, but this is the magic of loose coupling that we mentioned in the beginning. I have an object. Any number of things can care about that object. It, you can tie as many things on here as you want, and you keep adding features to your application, and your application revolves around this object. Just loosely coupling these things using this observer pattern. It kind of looks like a sun. <laughs> it makes you happy. Um, <laughs> none of these are going to interfere with any of those. You can't write anything here that would break that. It's all loosely bound and you can get rid of any one of these. And the application still works. You can turn these things off and on and then hook them back up again. It's pretty awesome. Okay. We're done. Ramble blog enough. Thanks for watching. Till next week. <laughs> Till next week is right. <laughs>